testing. All right. So check this out. There's this uh, famous sculpture that Michelangelo uh, created in the very late 1400s, 1498. I'm sure you've seen it before. It's this one, the Pieta. I don't know how to pronounce it the right way. Um, it's a famous sculpture of Mary, the Virgin Mary holding Jesus after his crucifixion, holding his dead body in her lap. And it's really interesting. I mean, it's a magnificent piece, as you can see. But um, it, was originally, it was originally commissioned by this French cardinal named Jean de Billieres. I don't know how to pronounce French, so I'll put the name on the screen in case you're curious. But um, it's, it's life-size, and it was created for, his, uh, for the cardinal's funeral monument. It was this particular building that was uh, his funeral uh, place, and it was designed to go into this rotunda and uh, be displayed as part of his, uh, his, his funeral monument. Uh, but in the 1800s, it was moved to St. Peter's in the Vatican City, where it is today in the vast, that amazing cathedral there, uh, was moved there and uh, put on display. So, so it started to get some, it's a magnificent piece. No one can deny that. But some people who were not quite ardent Catholics uh, would complain about the piece that it seemed to, the focus seemed of the piece seemed to be Mary. And here it is, Jesus' death and resurrection, or his, his crucifixion, which should have been all about him. And that it seemed that the way they were, that it's portrayed here is that it's, uh, it's making it all about Mary. It's elevating her higher than they were comfortable with. So it was garnering some criticism. So um, when they did more study onto the way that, the, that it was originally intended to be displayed in this cardinal's monument, which had been knocked down by this time, long before then, and create, there was something else created there, uh, they discovered that it was this, ro this rotunda that was all solid walls with a door in it and nice tall ceilings, and all the light that was coming in was coming in through windows up near the ceiling, top down, so the, it was supposed to be lit from above. So a funny thing happened. When they put it into the Vatican City, the St. Peter's there, they lit it from the front and uh, just to give it to, so that people can see it. Here, I'll show you this. So you get a good look at the whole thing because it's such a magnificent piece. But a funny thing happens when you light it from above. When you light it from above as it was intended, um, Mary is cast in shadow and Jesus just comes alive in the light. It's like when you see it in its proper context, uh, it tells a completely different story than it does in its current context, or at least in its current context as of a couple years ago. Uh, depending on how you light the sculpture, it tells a completely different story. So lighting it from the front uh, seems to make Mary prominent. Lighting it from above, as was intended, makes Jesus like the sole focus. It's really remarkable. So uh, it got me thinking about a number of things uh, recently. But here, let me show you this, because uh, the last couple of years they had a company come in to install a new lighting scheme that will light this particular piece uh, in St. Peter's in four different configurations. Here, let me show you this. So now, depending on the event or the holiday or whatever the occasion is, they can choose to light it in any of four different ways, including the one that was intended. You see the difference here between uh, the way that it was portrayed uh, with this warm, universal light that seemed to try to highlight the whole thing. Uh, and then they switched to a colder LED light, which gives it a more marble look, like a, like a colder, harsher, but more beautiful and crisp and clear look. And then when they light it from above, uh, it, it casts Mary's face in shadow, and the, fo the focus is on Jesus, like, completely. So they, they seem to understand that and have allowed for that now, which is interesting. So this whole dynamic of taking something that was created out of its normal, out of the context it was intended, and out of the light that it was intended by the, by the person that created it, putting it in a different context altogether and lighting, bringing your own light to it, if you will, tells a whole different story. And it opens up the piece to a number of criticisms that would not normally make sense if it was in its proper context. Michelangelo is not here anymore to defend his piece and to, to see that it's properly displayed. 
And so that got me to thinking. Uh, I have been studying for the last few months, at least intensely, just the history of the church from the, its beginning until modern day. And it, ha it has caused some, uh, some concern among the, some of those who, who care about me, as though it could be a distraction. Uh, what I think... <clears throat> Boy, there's a number of things I'd like to say. Uh, I've been, I think that it's important for me to fill in all these dark bla blanks in my uh, understanding of the scripture and the gospel and the church in its proper historic context so that I can see how it evolved. Because there's a, there's a narrative that's told there from the founding of the church through to today that, that makes sense out of the way the churches are today. I would say the church is way, the way the church is today, but the church is it's so fractured. And... Uh, Part of it has to do with this, I think, this understanding of the light. Uh, if you would consider this book, the Bible, as uh, in this analogy, the equivalent of that statue there, where you, where you put this and how you bring your light to it can tell completely different stories. So it, it puts the focus on different things. And to me, that's helping me to understand uh, all the different denominations, all the different uh, factions and sects, and how they're all uh, viewing the same book from different perspectives and coming to radic often radically different conclusions. And somehow I think that's okay. So we're going to talk about that in the context of learning. Uh, we're going to talk about it in, uh, well, I, I don't want to list all the ways we'll talk about it because I'm probably going to forget them because as usual, I've done a lot of research, made some basic notes, and now I'm just diving in and recording this uh, just to see how it goes. Learning. <clears throat> Preachers. Uh, scholars, uh, professors, in secular and in, and in uh, theological circles. The information that they present, the historical information, the scriptural information, their take on the Bible, everyone's, everyone is trained to assess this thing and pull out the, the valuable information and from history and present it to those like myself who are eager to learn it. So th that dynamic of taking information and presenting it, <clears throat> if it's presented by a person who is putting their own light on it and then presenting the information, is that valuable or do you need to find people who don't put light on it at all and just give you the dry facts so that you can cast your own light on it or see how it fits in with your belief system the way you're viewing it at the moment? <clears throat> at what point do you trust the person that is talking to you and teaching you or preaching at you? The, the man behind the pulpit, the man behind the lectern in the classroom, uh, or any of these videos like the ones I make. When do, at what point do you trust the, the, that the information that's being given to you is something that you can assimilate safely and it isn't something that has been... I don't want to say tainted or twisted and presented in a way that reflects the person's talking and in an effort to subconsciously perhaps get you to believe the same thing about these facts that I do, to see them in the same light that I'm bringing. Uh, and then you take that information and see if it fits with your belief system and you can add it in a way that, that looks right in your still life, if you will, the light you're bringing on it, then, then you may be more prone to accept it than if, you, if it didn't fit and it just looked like it was standing out like a sore thumb or it didn't fit with your narrative, so you chuck it. My mentor, Paul Dillinger, has this really interesting thing that he says about the three different types of teaching. He said, because he's an instructor and a professor, he said, when you come to a classroom and you present something that a student already knows and they just nod and agree with you as you're talking, he says, that's not teaching. That's just, that's something else. You're not giving this person any new information. They already know it and they've already put their spin on it and they're already accepting it. But if you come and present information that they don't have, that's a whole nother kind of, of teaching. Then how you present it, they'll take it and assess it and see how it fits into what they already know and see if they can get it to fit in there right. Otherwise, it'll just fall off. But if you come and you're preaching or teaching them something that goes directly against something that they already believe, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where the real teaching happens. If you're presenting something that contradicts what they already believe, then that's where the fat gets in the fire, so to speak. So there's three different dynamics of teaching there that I think is really fascinating and worth uh, chewing on. But as far as 
me. I watch lots of, of lectures online, university level lectures. I watch lots of sermons. I try to watch people from across the spectrum because I want to see where they're coming from. I want to see the arguments that they're making and how they're crafting their support for it, where they're pointing to in the scriptures, how they're using the scriptures, if they are at all, to support what they're saying. I'm fascinated by that dynamic. And um, these videos that I make that are things to think about, I had hoped from the outset that it was clear that the purpose of these videos were just to present information and say sort of a, a snapshot of where I'm at at the moment, where I'm at. These are the things I'm looking at. These are the things I'm thinking about. I try to lay all the pieces out on the table and say, this is how I'm kind of putting them together at the moment in a way that makes sense to me. I'm not married to it, but this is what makes the most, this is the best I can do right now with what I've been chewing on and studying in the scriptures and in the church history. What do you guys think? So it's more conversational and observational. I'm not a scholar. I don't have any PhDs. I don't have uh, any uh, credentials other than I'm just a fellow believer like you uh, who is studying the scriptures and trying to make sense of life and of the of the scriptures and of the church and of mankind and to get a, my try to get my brain around what it is that God is doing. So. Um, I don't know. I hope I haven't misrepresented myself as far as some authority on something. I just have strong thoughts, but they're certainly up for the, the, for evolution. <laughs> I'm, that's why I'm looking. I'm looking through history. I want to get a really good, comfortable feel for history. Uh, for starters, from the foundation of the church through to today, through to today, I want to have a good feel for what went on in every century that leads up from zero until the current church today. I see what issues were dealt with as the centuries progressed. Who were the major players? Uh, in uh, I'm talking primarily in Europe and in the Mediterranean region. There, maybe Egypt. Uh, but uh, I'll, at some point in my life, I'll look in more into India, into China. But for there, for now, that's my focus. I want to see how the church started, what the situation was like when it started, and how it evolved over the centuries, who the major players were, what the thoughts were, what the things they were wrestling with, and how they came to their conclusions as to what beliefs were acceptable and which ones were heresies. And as the centuries progress, I'd like to know who the major players are so that I can see as they resolved one issue, it created the foundation and the context for what came up next, whatever the next issues were. And then who were the minds that tackled that from both sides? What issues did they, did they handle? And how did that produce the next group? that had? And how did that march from the foundation of the church and the Apostle Paul all the way through until today? I look at some of the, how fractured everybody is. In the, in the Christian world, in the, in the religious world in general, not just with all flavor of uh, Bible-based of uh, religions, but other religions as well, it seems like everyone forever is at each other's throat. And I think it has something to do with this initial concept of the, the Pieta, how you light it. I think everybody is bringing their own light. And for some reason that I haven't understood yet, I don't want to just dismiss it as, oh, that's just sin. I think there's something there that's, that's worth investigating. For some reason, when, if you've got the way you view something, it seems to be human nature to anyone who believes something else is suspect. There are anything from to be avoided to heretics to be destroyed. I'm just shocked as the as the centuries tick by how often it was true that whoever had the dominant hand could arrest those who believe differently on any number of issues, great or small, have them labeled heretics and, and punished or tortured or even put to death. Would you feel comfortable putting to death another Christian who believed something different from you? I think we, we all look at things within our own light, and in that light, there's certain criticisms and critiques we could make that make sense in that light. If someone else is looking at the same thing from a different perspective, those critiques of that first person don't make sense. I've run into that firsthand uh, lately. I won't tell you over what, but there was some criticism labeled at something that I did that I felt were out of context because my intention in creating what I did was this, and this is the light that it's supposed to be <clears throat> viewed under. If you come at it from another perspective and bring your own light and shine it from a different direction, like the Pieta, <clears throat> it tells a whole other story. And from 
the other person's perspective with the light that they're viewing it on, all their critiques were valid, if that was the intention. So at what point does the intention of the creator of this piece of art of some kind, and it applies to everything, short films and books and, uh, and writings of all kinds and paintings and, and sculptures, as you can see, Michelangelo's not here, as I said, to defend himself and to explain himself. All we have is the end product. <clears throat> And a lot of times these videos that are created and put online as an end product, uh, the viewer bringing their own light to it can, have, can find fault with it. And are they right or are they wrong? What's the truth of the matter? Because you take the object and you look at it from the Calvinistic perspective, you see certain verses in stark, they stand out amazingly. And then other verses get explained away or ignored completely. And yet you get an Arminian who looks at the same verses from a different perspective and it tells a different story. So each, each of these guys, that's just an example. You could go back into you know, Anabaptists and various forms of Protestants and Quakers and all the different splinter groups that, that rose up and died off and Wesleyans and Methodists and Lutherans. and Everyone seems to have their own view of what these verses are saying and it's remarkable. I mean, I'll, let me give you an example here. Check this out. So, and let me start this. Let me see here. Let's record this so that I can show you the screen here. Close that. Open this. Now check out this passage from 1 John. One of the things I've been studying lately, and it ties directly into what we're talking about, is this concept of, tr of truth. What is truth? The last video I made, it was the, one of the questions was, how do you like your truth? And that fits into this. What is your light could be another way to say that. The light that you're bringing. It's like we're all in darkness, right? And, and Jesus comes as a light. But what place, what, what role does each of us play in what we do with that light? How we ref refract it or, or, or mirror it onto what we're looking at so that we try to understand life and people and history and the gospel. It's like, what are we doing? So look at this at, for, on 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 24 through 27. This is interesting to me. This scrambles my brain and has for the last couple of days. I can't get my brain around it. It doesn't make sense to me. Look at this. Therefore, here. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. I know when you say therefore, you're supposed to go to see what just immediately preceded it. That will help to define the context that the that the statue is supposed to be displayed in. So let's take a look at that real quick. On um, and right now, that, those are just my notes. Let me go f here to First John. Let's see, John. If there's an, anyone more inscrutable than John in both his gospel and in his letters and in Revelation. I don't know who. It's, he's just incredible. So you back up a couple verses. He's talking about truth and deception. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. It has to do with denying the Son. Uh, who acknowledges the Son acknowledges, has the Father also. Here's verse 24. Let, therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. So that sounds like something we are supposed to do. John is telling these believers that are receiving this letter, let the truth abide in you. That means you can let it not abide. It means you can, you can decide that truth doesn't fit and you can chuck it. He's saying, let it abide in you which you heard from the beginning. The beginning of what? <laughs> the beginning of their interaction with John or their beginning of their Christian walk? The beginning of their life? The beginning of, of, what? of what? I wonder what he's referring to here. Let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. Now look at this. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. If what you heard from the beginning is abiding in First he says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Then he says, and if you let that abide in you, then you will in turn abide in the Father and in the Son. Abide in them. So this is a great example of what light do you bring to that concept of abiding in, of truth abiding in you. Where does it abide in you? In your brain, in your heart, in your gut, somewhere spiritually? 
It seems like a human being is a vessel of some kind to be filled up with something. So can you, is there a space inside of each of us for truth to abide in? And then it says, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. We will abide in them. Where in them? What is that dynamic? How can a person, a human being like myself, abide in Jesus? In him? in him. Now, do do we it does the light do we bring literal light to that? Like somehow we are enveloped inside of him, like we're living in a house and Jesus is the house, like we're like a living house or or is it mean in his what? Under his blessings, under the umbrella, under the protection, like Israel as long as they were obedient were under the protection, but that time that the dancing girls came out and they sinned, that God withdrew his protection and then they were open to uh stuff they weren't open to while they were under his protection. Is that what it means to abide in him? Does it mean to follow what he's said? So you're abiding in the precepts that he sets out, and therefore if you follow what he said and are obedient obedient to it, then that's abiding in him? What do you suppose that means? Any number of, of uh, denominations will bring different light. Not only will the denominations, but each individual in that particular church like I said before, you could get any 10 Christians to, to read this and, and have an intense discussion and, and come up with probably a half a dozen different definitions for what does that mean to abide in Christ and abide in the Father. And is that the same thing? Can you abide in the Son but not in the Father? They're united, so it seems to me that you would be abiding in both of them or neither of them. And what does it mean to not abide in them? Could you be a Christian and not abide in the Father? Is this an extra goal that those who are doing it correctly can achieve? Or is this uh, something that just been the day you believe you're, uh, you're in them and you can abide in them? This, see, this is, this is what I'm talking about. And then others will not even see these verses. And I'm probably in that boat and probably for years I read this and just skimmed right by it because it just it does not compute, you know. And so it, it gets jettisoned. It's like it's like the seed gets stolen immediately. The birds come in and take it and it's gone because it doesn't fit right, right? With my belief system, the way I'm looking at the scripture, the light that I'm shining on it, which may or may not be accurate. How do you know how you're supposed to view this? How do you know what truth is? This is the promise that he has promised us, it continues in verse 25. This is the promise to abide in them is the promise. Is that what he's referring to or is he referring to something else? This is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. So is this abiding in the Father and in the Son a synonym for eternal life? Is that what John's saying or has he moved on to another thought here like it's the book of Proverbs? I think it's got to be connected. So this idea of truth abiding in you, you abiding in the Son and in the Father, whatever that means, I don't know. I've got ideas, but who knows whether I'm accurate or not. And that somehow describes this concept of what eternal life is. It isn't just living forever in heaven. Boy, I've got so much I'd like to say. These things I have written to you, verse 26, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. So you see, there's people who are trying to get you to believe a lie for whatever reason. Intentionally, unintentionally. If someone unintentionally presents something that's not true, are they still a liar? I mean, I can understand if someone who is intentionally trying to teach you something false. Or, like I said earlier, a teacher who is presenting information and spinning it with their own, shining their own light on it in order to get you to believe like they do. If they do that intentionally, knowing that they're misrepresenting the information, that's a lie, right? But if someone does that honestly and they actually think that they're doing that, that it's what they believe is right, because no one's shown them otherwise. My father has been telling me lately the the idea of that verse that the the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us into all truth. I'll put that on the screen. So has the Holy Spirit not guided that particular preacher into truth yet? If he's preaching something that's not true. I don't understand the dynamics of it, but it's fascinating to me. The dynamics of truth and how we get it in us. And how then how we interact with others who seem to have a different understanding of the, that same truth. <laughs> is truth multifaceted or is one person right and everyone else wrong on some level, some degree? Is that you either hit the bullseye and everything outside of it from a quarter inch to a mile is missed the mark. And it's, it's, it's a very, you know, a shade of untruth. 
and there's only one very precise definition of truth in any given realm, or is it, uh, what is it? What are the dynamics of truth? That reminds me. Let's look at John, um, not one. Let's do a lot of John tonight. John uh, chapter 18, when Jesus is standing before Pilate. And Pilate asks him that quintessential philosophical question, what is truth? Verse 38. But let's, all right, so Pilate says to him, what is truth? And then he goes out and says, I don't find any fault in him. I'm going to let him go. And, they, you know, you know how it plays out. But back up one verse to verse 37. Pilate says, therefore, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? That's what Jesus just said earlier. My kingdom is not of this world. That's another, how do you like that verse? How do you understand that verse? My kingdom is not over this world. There's like a half a dozen things that come to the top of my brain that, that, that pop in that could put a different spin on that, that statement. What he's saying and why. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. His disciples or his servants? Are those two different classes or is he talking about the same group? so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. So he says, are you a king then? And Jesus says something fascinating. You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world, <clears throat> that I should bear witness to the truth. <clears throat> and now listen to this. This, this one is a, is a showstopper. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. How many different ways could you take that verse? Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Yet there is something specific that Jesus is saying there in that context to Pilate, right? Is it safe to say that there's one thing that Jesus meant when he said that? Or does he did he say something knowing that... Um, a half a dozen or more different ways that could be... Is he saying a lot of things at once, or is he just saying one thing there? Everyone who is of the voice, or of the truth, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. <laughs> I don't even know how to proceed. Everyone, before they hear the voice of the Lord, before they're a Christian, before they're a believer, they're just a, a, a person in need of salvation. If they're of the truth, when Jesus comes and, and speaks, they'll hear it. Say, what is that? They'll perk up. Or is it talking about everyone who's already a Christian and has been living after him for a while, has learned to hear his voice. So you're a Christian, you're pursuing him, you're, now you are of the truth, whatever that means, and now you hear his voice. So is he talking about those who are unsaved who are of the truth or those who are saved already and are of the truth? How many people are saved at this point in the story? He's talking to Pilate. This is before his crucifixion. Were people saved before he rose from the dead? There are people who had their sins forgiven. On what basis did Jesus forgive sins before the crucifixion and resurrection? Before the sacrifice was made, he was forgiving sins. The paralytic that they lowered through the roof. Your sins are forgiven. What? Who is this that forgives sins? Well, so that you know that the Son of Man has the power to, on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man, take up your bed and walk. You know, what's easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven, or take up your bed? And walk. So he was forgiving sins. Now, were those was that legitimate forgiveness of sins, or was that like a precursor that didn't quite count, or maybe a down payment until the sacrifice had been made? Depending on your denomination, depending on the era of history that you live in, depending on your particular church and your pastor and leadership and how they present things, there's any number of ways you could view this verse. For this cause I was born. Is he piggybacking that on the previous statement? You say that I'm a king for this cause I was born. For this cause meaning to be a king? Or does, is he setting up the next statement? For this, you say that I'm a king, period, end. All right, now, new thought. For this cause I was born. For this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. So what cause, what, for the, he's telling Pilate why he came here into the earth. This is why I came, he said. All right, so is he saying, I came to be a king, or is he saying, I came to bear witness to the truth? 
Both of those concepts are fascinating. He came here to be a king, but he wasn't a king. He died uh, on, on a thieves' cross. He wasn't a king while he was walking around here. So that's in the future. He will be a king and the king with a capital K. But at this point, why would he say that? I'm a king, but my kingdom is not from this world. I'm a, I'm a king in exile. I'm a king who's just visiting, just passing through. For this cause I was born. Wow. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. That has to do with that light that we're talking about. So Jesus came into a place that was dark and he brought light. That's in John 1. Check this out. We'll come back here. <clears throat> Verse 4. In him, Jesus, was life. And the life in him was life. That is another thought. Look at that. How many different ways could you look at that at trying to understand that? In Jesus was life. Seems like a no-brainer, right? But really, chew on that for a minute. In him was life, meaning he was alive, or in him is the life that goes out from him in order to give life to other people. And he was he was the source of life, or is it just saying light? He was alive. He he had that life in him that came from God. Because <laughs> any number of ways, and and then you could build whole doctrines with this one of these the verses like this as its foundation. <clears throat> you could be wildly off base. You could paint it in a completely different light and tell a completely different story, a completely different gospel, and get lots of people to believe it, depending on how, how clever you are. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So there's this connection here between life and light. God, there's so much in the Old and New Testament about light. We could do... We could talk forever on that, but I don't. I know it fits with this with the the Pieta uh, analogy, but um, I don't want this to go on forever. This video, I mean, in him was life. The life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There's a lot of stuff going on here. A lot of concepts here. The light is connected to truth, and it's connected to life. It says in chapter 3 that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Life. The light comes and then we see our lives differently. We see the gospel differently. We see people differently. We see the world. We see history differently. Depending on what kind of light and how it's configured. In filmmaking, you could light us a couple actors in any number of different ways and set completely completely different moods, tell different types of stories and different genres with the same setting and the same actors, just depending on where you position the lights. Because it works on a subconscious level. It's like those that view of the Pieta. Let me show it again. See these four different ways that they have it light there? That just I could try to explain it to you, but it, it do nothing like just looking at it yourself. You see that? Four different lights configurations telling four different stories, and they're all legitimate in their context, but how important is it to know the way it was intended? How important is it to know the way that this was intended to be read and understood? We've had 2,000 years of this, and we've had every interpretation under the sun, every denomination, every sect, every, every group, all, all over the place. And even within all of those, they divide, I think, my opinion, uh, and those lines that we talked about in the last video between those who approach things cere cerebrally and those who approach them emotionally. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness of the light, capital L. So he's saying Jesus is the light. So that through him, lower H, that's John, so that through John all might believe. Any number, every one of these verses you could chew on, and it's just, it's like a bottomless, it's like, and there's so many different ways to look at it. And w is there one way that John meant this? Or is he purposely being cryptic so that we could all bring our own light to it and, and get different lessons from the same verse? I don't know. I don't know. He was not that light, John was not, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Let me tell you about this light. Again, you can tell people about light, but unless they, it's different than if they see it. 
<laughs> it's like you're in pitch black and someone strikes a match. You see it. Someone can tell you about light if you're sitting there in pitch black, but when it happens, you don't have to say anything. It just it, it draws your attention and you're there. The, the dynamics of this are just fascinating to me. Look at verse 9. That was the true light, capital L, light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Gives light to every man. Me and you. Jesus came, according to John 1, to bring light to every man so that we could see, right? What's the point of light? What's the purpose of light? To light up the darkness so you can see. So it's like a um, solution to blindness in a way. That's what Jesus is. He came, that's what he said in John, what was it, 9? When, when did he heal the man born blind? This is, that's another verse where he says why he came into the world. Jesus said, I came to, so that those who were blind might see, and those who see might be made blind. And then they said, are we blind also? And he said, if you were, listen to this. Here's another one. Tell me how you like this verse and how you understand it. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. That's one that puts the brakes on the bus. If you were blind, you would have no sin. Is that legit? I mean, can we take that at face value? Can you be literal about that verse, or do you have to put a spin on it in some way? Do you have to cast a certain light on it from a certain direction to understand that? If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Wow. So, yeah, think about this Michelangelo uh, sculpture, and think about how you light what you view just on a day-to-day -day basis, what you believe. It's got to be tied to what you believe. Either, the, either what you believe is the light that you use to interpret stuff, or the way you light it, it helps to understand and build what you believe. I don't know which one comes first, how they work together. It's really interesting to think about. So that's what I've been thinking about lately, uh, the last couple days. And I thought I'd at least lay it out there and see if that uh, would get you guys thinking on stuff. Uh, what do you think? that do anything for you <laughs> all right well I've got plenty of other stuff I want to talk about it's sort of an extrapolation and a continuation of these concepts but I wanted to at least get this foundation laid uh, so that um, I could move on in a way that would make sense because the groundwork is there so yeah as I study through the history of the church it's really fascinating to watch it evolve and I think it's okay. I don't know. Somehow it's okay. I don't want you to think I'm being critical of, of church history or of different people who are doing their best to serve God and may or may not have made a mess of things that other people have had to try to address who may or may not have solved them right or may have just made things worse. I don't know. It's interesting to watch it all. I'm trying to look at it objectively. Um, but yeah, interesting. All right. I'm going to stop this here so that it doesn't meander too much more. Uh, if you got anything to add in the comments, cool. Otherwise, just, you know, say a prayer for me every now and then if you could, just because I feel like I'm pushing into new ground with all of this. And uh, there's not anybody who really seems to be willing to go with me on this. So that's uh, all right. I feel like a scout, you know. <laughs> That's, that sounds arrogant. I don't know how else to put it. I feel like I'm wandering in an area that I have never thought about before. So it might as well be new ground to me. Uh, and so I'm looking around. So there's probably things, pits to fall in and things to avoid. I'm trying to be observant and try to, trying to let the Holy Spirit guide me. Let me throw that in there real quick. Isaiah 50. Not Isaiah 50, Isaiah 30. Here we go. You've heard this verse before has to do with teachers. Look at this, verse 20. And, the, and though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore. I have no idea what that means. But look what the teachers do. But your eyes shall see your teachers. And there, verse 21. Your ears will hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. 
I'm assuming that's your teachers talking, a voice behind you. You won't see it, you'll hear it. This is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn off to the right hand or to the left. So you start wandering off the path, like we talked about in the last video, the path between reason and faith. You start wandering off too far in one direction, the voice behind you, your teachers, right? Is it the voice of the teachers or the voice of God or the voice of God through the teachers? I don't know. It says your eyes will see your teachers. Your ears will hear a voice. So you'll see and you'll hear. Uh, this is the way. Walk in it. No, no, no. Back over here. Oh, okay. Whenever you turn to the right hand or to the left, defile the images of silver. I don't know what all that means, but it's fascinating. It seems to have an act of purification. Get out, it says. You throw away your unclean things. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of really deep and interesting concepts that seem to be intermingling and interacting here. And uh, is it worth trying to understand this, or should we just shrug and accept it and move on and just be happy with what we currently have? I don't know. I'm not satisfied. And I don't know whether that's of God or not, but I'm just pursuing it to see where it goes. And hopefully uh, God will tell me when I veer off one way or the other that this is the path walk in it. All right, I will talk to you guys in the next video, whenever that is, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, thanks, bye.